Run, Carl, run, run. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Uh, it's lightning talks time. Yay! Um, for those of you who haven't been to a conference with lightning talks before, they are one of my favorite parts of the conference. Um, they are opportunities for people to give short talks with or without slides um, on any topic uh, they might be interested in. Now, this year we uh, decided to uh, take submissions for them and uh, I ran the selection process, so looked through all the pieces of paper. There were 36 of them, it was a very difficult process, and picked the 14 talks that you're going to see today. Um, so as I mentioned, um, each talk is going to go for three minutes and to make sure that things move relatively quickly, they're going to be relatively strictly timed. Uh, Tim, our, our laptop operator over there, is waving at you. You can see there's a TV over there that says start at the moment. Uh, when the talks begin, there will be numbers on those. Those numbers correspond to the number of minutes and seconds remaining in the talk. You may be familiar with what a clock looks like. <laughs> now, when the clock gets down to like 10 seconds or thereabouts, we need to make sure that the people on the, uh, on the stage are wrapping up and, and finishing. But please do not count them down because that makes it really, really hard for them to focus on what they're saying. So what we instead want to do is make them really aware of it. And how we're going to do that is we're going to make a really quiet applause. So if you bash your index fingers together like this and get louder and louder as the last 10 seconds counts down, and then when the timer reaches zero, burst into really loud applause <laughs> until you can't hear the speaker anymore. <laughs> OK, you seem pretty well practiced. Uh, so that means it's time for us to begin these lightning talks. And up first, we have Nick Steenhout, who's going to tell us about accessibility fails in the real world. Good afternoon. Um, I'm hope to, uh, hoping to inject some humor in this uh, last day of the conference. Uh, it's not directly technically related, but every example I'm going to show can be related in some way to uh, the real world. So it's up to you to think about how could that relate. So of course the first example may not relate to uh, many of you, but it's a ramp and it's filled with snow, which is a problem enough as it is, but um, they managed to put two huge potted trees at the bottom of the ramp. I was looking for cold medicine that day and I tell you what, I had to go to another pharmacy. This one is great. I didn't want to go into the McDonald's uh, at the Strand down by uh, Westfield Mall or something like that. They put in a very expensive chair ramp, so it flips and it goes up, but to get to the chair ramp you have to go up a step. <laughs> How does that work? Um, here's a church in Christchurch. So, yeah, I don't need to make any comments there. I think it's self-explanatory. I did go around the building to see if there was another way in, and there wasn't. So, um, it's great sentiment, but maybe a little bit of a brain fart there. Now, here they were very helpful. They put in a button to open the door um, and to call for assistance. But how do you get there if you're in a wheelchair? Or if you're a mom with a stroller? or if you have any other kind of uh, mobility impairment. It's, it's just really great kind of thinking to, to make these kind of things. Um, now, I tried to vote that day. This is the entrance, the accessible entrance to the polling booth in, uh, in my voting district. And they decided that they were going to block the entrance to the only ramp into the uh, place. So technically, yes, uh, it's accessible for voting, but then we put a barrier right in front of it. And that happens sometimes on the web. Now, this is trivial, you know, uh, you just have to move the signs, but the signs are right in front of the only two accessible parking spaces, uh, which was not very useful to be able to park and go into the uh, gas station. And there's another one coming up. Aha! So, a power pole right on the curb cut, that's in Montreal. I just could not believe it when it happened. The thing is, it happened two blocks further, another power pole right in front of the curb cut. Now this is kind of like 
a bit weird and you think this is an old power pole or, or telephone pole, whichever, an old sidewalk. So it happened. But there's something a little bit more modern here. They built a fully compliant ramp, curb ramp. Uh, it's spot on, 100% compliant, but there's big power lines at the end. So who knows how we're going to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so on deck we have Matt Senger, but first, Ducky with Etching and Goulash. Hello everyone, I'm Ducky. I ran the games of Boss Miniconf with Tim, who is counting down. Maybe some extra time, man. We helped. We organized together. Um, and we made our speakers some lovely gifts to appreciate them. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about these, because I made them with like no knowledge of circuits and boards, and these are my first ever PCBs. Um, so first off, these are the ingredients. Um, so the main bit is the blue ones. They're copper boards with a photosensitive layer, um, which is very important for etching. Uh, the other requirements are like a folio with your circuit design, I won't talk about that, uh, an exposure book, and some developer, uh, and a distilled, bath, uh, distilled water bath, as well as the very important bit, which is your etching solution. Um, a disclaimer, the board in this picture was actually um, oxidized and only partially works. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the boards in this one, yeah, this was my first ever board and didn't actually work either. Uh, so that was really great. But learning, um, so this, I went through a lot of different setups. This was my like fifth or sixth uh, setup and probably the most successful. Um, so you go through the first step, gloves, very important. You don't want etching on your hands. You've got the boards and you have the exposure box. Um, Important part about the exposure box, this doesn't actually mean 150 seconds. This is one minute and 50 seconds. Please don't do this if you're making a box with a timer. Maybe have labels or just, just two seconds. It would be great. Uh, the next step is once you've exposed your board, uh, the photosensitive layer to it, you put it in the developer and it will develop the beautiful pattern that you have given it. Uh, then you chuck it in the water bath, then you chuck it in the etchant and wait a long time. So long that you start learning to knit, which is what I decided to do. <laughs> Um, then you take it out, you put it into some distilled water, and hopefully it's all lovely and it works. Uh, the next step we went through for hours was we used a jigsaw, because obviously I'm etching, and I have no idea how to use a CNC milling machine yet. Um, and then you get a lovely penguin, yay! Um, so we got a lot of those, we drilled holes in their heads for various good reasons, um, and then we soldered them all together, and this is what we achieved! Hooray! Um, <laughs> But how does this fit into goulash? And this is the real reason I wanted to tell you uh, about this today, is I live in Germany now. I'm from Tasmania originally. I'm still not very good at German. You might have noticed I've avoided using any German words in this presentation. Um, and the reason this links in is because the only reason I've been able to like learn this is because I was at an awesome hackerspace called Entropia, uh, which is where in the same place where I live now. And the reason I'm part of, I, attend Entropia is because I went to this awesome place uh, called the Goulash Programmiernacht and I really want to get you guys to come because if you come to Germany I promise I will work on an Auslander wiki and find out English languages and then you can see me again and I can see you and I don't have to pay really expensive flights. <laughs> Thanks Ducky, that was great. Uh, so on deck on this side we have Steve Dalton. Uh, but first, Matt Senja is going to tell us about improving diversity at our events. Hi, uh, so I'm Matt, or Matt Sen. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, all of the content that I'm going to talk about here is available at this URL, which is also accessible via a QR code. Um, that URL is mattsen, M-A-T-T-C-E-N, dot com slash diverse underscore events. Um, uh, I would like to start by acknowledging um, the Godigal people of the Euro Nation uh, as the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, so uh, LCA are pretty good at diverse events. Um, they've done a whole lot of work with diversity and outreach uh, to make their events accessible. I think that all of us though could you know, do to learn how to be better. We can all, we can all be better at this um, and I think it's useful to put together some bullet points of the things that people do wrong most regularly. So basically, I threw, threw together this blog post that explains a lot of this stuff. So I'll go through some of the stuff now. Um, when we're talking about you know, diversity, we, we may talk about diversity of race. Um, I started this 
with an acknowledgement of country because today is Australia Day and I wanted to acknowledge the land on which we stand. Um, accessibility, ac having accessible venues with ramps, accessible toilets, um, hearing loops for people who are hearing impaired, um, reading out slides if you need to for people who can't see very well, uh, making sure that your websites are accessible. Using di uh, for dietary requirements, having free text fields for people to put their dietary requirements rather than having them check this, that or the other thing without an other field. Um, people have nuanced requirements. Um, gender, having gender neutral bathrooms if your venue allows them. Um, suggest pronoun as a candidate for the content of your, your badges so that you know, people know, you know, if you've got a free text field, people know that they could put their pronoun in there if they, if they wish and it, it indicates that you are aware of people who aren't gender conforming. Um, if, assuming you need to know gender for statistical analysis or whatever, you know, only ask for the information that you need um, and have it as a free text field because again, people don't all fit, fit into boxes. Um, women's cut t-shirts is a big one. A lot of people forget about t-shirts and unisex is not unisex. Um, and trying to avoid gendered language. Um, guys is a contentious word. I personally think that it is a gendered word. Um, just think about the way you use your language. Um, some people don't have a first name and a last name. Um, some people have their names reversed. Some people have mononyms. Um, so ask for the full name and ask for an informal name of address if you're going to address them in a newsletter or whatever. Um, so have two separate fields like that. Um, Socioeconomic backgrounds, some people can't necessarily afford to come to events like this, so offer grants or sponsorships for them. Uh, childcare programs, having childcare um, or youth activities for kids. Um, newbies, discourage content culture, welcome newbies to events, and have a turn of fun back. Thank you. Uh, a good list of, of things that we can all do better. Uh, on this side, Paul Hesler, but first, Steve Dalton. Hi everyone, my name is Steve. I am from the Gold Coast Tech Space. I'm here to tell you about an event we run every other Saturday. It's called Kid Hack. And I can only really describe it as kind of a tech sort of Montessori, throw everything in the middle. We just leave the kids to do their own thing. It's totally unorganised. Partially because I kind of like, in, I'm interested in self-organising teams and partially I'm just super lazy and don't like organising anything. So um, basically we have a load of kids, they arrive, um, some kids have projects and they use us as a bit of a drop-in centre, they're stuck, they need someone to help them get a, over a hump, whether it's some coding or some electronics or something like that. Um, secondly, we have a load of kits, so we have ranging from, you know, the $1 AliExpress kits that you can buy for, you know, little electronic dice and things like that. Uh, we use the uh, Evil Mad Scientist kits, I don't know if you know those guys in, uh, in Silicon Valley, awesome shout out to them. And um, things like Freetronics, we use Chibitronics, um, we've tried to get some more girls into the group using the Papercraft, um, which has been reasonably successful. And um, also some of our members have their own projects that they want to try out and we'll throw, throw them in there with the kids and the kids just get stuck in. So, um, as I said, it's really a free-for-all. Any kids that don't have a project, we have taker parts. We have a whole lot of hard drives. One of our members works in medical electronics and he brings along some really interesting medical machines that the kids pull apart and sometimes they'll take motors and solder them together with um, LEDs and make generators and it's pretty good fun to watch what they come up with. Um, I have a ute and at the end of it we throw a whole lot of stuff on the back of my ute and it all goes off to e-waste and the guys at the tip um, I don't know what they think of me every week, throwing all this uh, taken apart stuff into their bins, but it does actually get pulled apart and um, reclaimed. Um, so yeah, one of the interesting things I've noticed is the kids actually um, teach themselves a lot. Often I don't actually have to do anything, I just end up hanging out with the parents. And we've got some kids who are starting to mentor each other and help each other. And it's really beautiful to watch. And um, it's one of the things they're not really getting at school, that kind of self-organising thing. Um, and sometimes they'll turn up and they'll just start sharing memes and actually not do any work at all and we just kind of leave them to it. Um, so I really like it. Um, they're going into the next phase now, we have some more advanced kids who really want to build a big project. So we're doing now a sort of Sunday project club where we're going to try and build some sort of big Rube Gold build machine or something like that to get the more advanced kids into that. But uh, highly recommend uh, you know, encouraging the kids to do this freeform hacking. It's, uh, it's a great thing and not a lot of work and um, that's about all I had to say. If you're on the Gold Coast, please come and visit us because we don't get very many visitors. So 
please come. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. It's, uh, it's great to hear the progress of the, uh, of the tech space over the last few years. Um, so from, uh, from hardware hacking to, uh, to data, uh, Paul Hessler is going to tell us about opening up Landsat imagery. So I've been wanting to all week. Uh, why am I nuts? Because uh, I'm giving a talk about a work project that I haven't had clearance from either my employer or my uh, client, but it's all open source, so that should be right. Uh, Landsat is a NASA project. It's awesome. Uh, first uh, launched in 1972, uh, Earth observation satellites. The most recent is Landsat 8, launched in February 20, uh, 2013. Uh, has 30 metre resolution, uh, seven spectral bands with 12 bits of dynamic uh, range per band, images of any given point on the Earth every 16 days, and a bunch of other stuff too. Uh, the data is open. You can download it from NASA. It's, it's, it's just there. Um, but it does need a bit of pre-processing before you can do anything useful with it. You need to adjust for the angle of the, of the satellite to the ground, the angle of the sun hitting the Earth, because it's solar reflectance data, to correct for terrain, project to a useful coordinate system. Geoscience Australia has done that all, all that for us. It's, um, uh, there's a normalised something, something reflectance data set. It's, um, <laughs> Uh, it's created with the Open Data Cube, which is an open source Python platform based on NumPy. Uh, and the data is all 100 odd terabytes of it is on the NCI. Uh, how many people here have accounts on the NCI? A few. How many people would be interested in exploring this data on their browser? Yeah, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, so that's where I come in. Uh, I've written a lightweight uh, Python WMS server to sit on top of the uh, Open Data Cube. Um, the WMS is uh, not the only uh, web map, uh, map protocol around. It has its pros and cons. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm nuts and you want to see a live demo. Um, <laughs> so I've got this ready. I'm just going to run this off my laptop where I have uh, about six months worth of data from Tasmania. So I can zoom to extent there. Um, so you, the, when you zoom it out too far in WMS, it usually just uh, blanks out and says, well, I don't have uh, data at this resolution. But um, I've got this feature where you can actually see where the data is. Uh, so if I pick that, you can see oh, this is where I got data for the 15th of January, uh, 2017. So let's zoom in a bit and see something. There it is, beautiful. Um, so but that's obviously just uh, red, green, blue. I said we had seven spectral bands. Let's look at some other stuff. Let's, uh, we can see it in multiband infrareds. So this is the three infrared bands just mapped to red, green, and blue. This is all being done on the fly. Um, there's also things like this, which is really nice. Um, so this is a, a vegetation index. Red means actively growing vegetation. Uh, and you can do things like uh, this is, um, oh, hang on, I've got to change the date on one of them. <laughs> Uh, no, this is this right. So this is um, uh, looking at land clearing. So this is uh, on the left here. We've got January. This is in, in February. You can see the forest there that's been chopped down, and uh, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, up on deck we have uh, Emma Sprinkmeyer. Uh, this next talk, I, I must have been hungry when I when I uh, accepted it. It says Project Nacho Secure Remote Access Powered by Guacamole. Uh, David Kempe. Thanks. Uh, um, yeah, so I put together a little project because I wanted to use guacamole. I called it Nacho because. Uh, sometimes when you're dealing with corporations, you kind of need to do a bit of marketing if you want to get it through the various powers that be. Um, and so, if nothing else, this is a helpful way of marketing a project where you have to deal with people like firewall administrators and you know CIOs and remote vendors and all these other people that are used to lots of paperwork. So Project Nacho is really a um, way of using a series of VPN tunnels and other things, and I have a sample thing, this will be on GitHub, to use uh, Guacamole. Guacamole is a HTML5 to RDP slash VNC slash SSH gateway, uh, open source project, works really well, uh, and of course I'm going to do a live demo so that we can all see how that works. Um, Two-factor authentication with uh, Duo security included, um, so you want to check it out. Uh, the architecture that I've given you there includes a vendor access portal which allows uh, uh, limited remote access for people without VPNs. Ideally, you use a VPN on top of this for staff. Um, so if I can just log in here, um, demo vendor, randomly crap password, 
Second factor authentication. Duo security is awesome, by the way, if you're looking for a second factor. Free for 10 users. I uh, approve the access on my phone. Ideally with a vendor, if you're giving this to a vendor, they would, you would give the second factor to your staff, give them the login details, then the staff can approve them to log in whenever they need to. Uh, if we want to check out remote desktop, this is a you know, Windows box with the LCA schedule on it, running over HTML5 on our excellent network here. Seems to work pretty well. Um, and uh, I can do Control Alt Shift and switch back here. See my session. I've got an SSH uh, session here. I can log in. Don't have time for that. And um, then uh, I can go back and use VNC and all those kind of things. So uh, ultimately, if we go back to the architecture, um, Guacamole lets you do all those things. The way I've got around the uh, security sort of implications is to have tunnels from a secure environment back out to a DMZ that allow the vendors to come in over SSL and then route the traffic through that. Um, please check out all the links. I'll update the documentation for it on my GitHub and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. I'm not going to take more of your time. Thank you. How are we going over here? We're, uh, we good here, Ryan? Just, uh, oh, I'm just uh, just making sure this laptop is absolutely ready to go before. I don't know how to use your laptop. It's, uh, we're not quite at the point where we call Keith up yet, but... Um okay, uh, so up on deck we have Ben O'Rice, uh, but first, Emma Sprinkmeyer. Thank you very much. Um, Hatsune Miku and the world of Vocaloids. Um, just some quick information about myself. I was born in Adelaide. I'm very almost 16, and I <laughs> I absolutely love Japan. I've I've been there, and it's beautiful. Um, I am sort of just an amateur at singing and art, artist, just drawing and sorry. Um, I was a volunteer last year and this year, and this is the first time I'm speaking in front of a crowd this large. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, Vocaloids are basically vocal androids. Um, I really love the, the sounds that they can make. It, it, they get higher and lower than human speakers, and Miku Hatsune is the most famous out of all of them, and her name actually means the first sound from the future. Um, most, most of the ones that I know of are from Krypton Future Media, and um, sing in multiple different languages. Um, Lola and Leon were the first two. They didn't have any bodies or anything. Um, Vocaloids can be used for years and n not much would change about them. Um, they don't have any issues with personal lives because they are <laughs> completely made by the companies, but they, they have live shows and it's really incredible because they have see-through screens and projectors and they interact like waving and talking and they, they can sprout wings or just go to the top of the stage in an instant or just disappear into a cloud of sparkles. It's really, really brilliant. And the amount of fans that they have is insane. Um, also, Krypton is, is just has the software out there and has even created um, Miku Miku Dance, which is a very popular, very, very well-known um, program where lots of people make their own models to just animate their own things and, and 
they can make their own songs as well, which is really cool. I haven't personally, but it, it, it sounds really interesting. Um, anywho, thank you very much. Son. Getting up and, and doing your first, uh, first ever conference talk in front of 650 people is really well done. Thanks, Emma. Um, Okay, so uh, on this side we have Paul McKenney, but first, Ben O'Rice with a talk that he absolutely promises will be clean, he promises. A bunch of internet libertarians walk into a venture capitalist's office, and the venture capitalist says, so what's your pitch? They say, right, so users submit transactions to the network. Miners collect transactions in the blocks. They get to choose which transactions they want, so we let them charge fees. Uh, the miners then throw as much brute force computing power as they can in order to take the prize in this block's cryptographic lottery. The miner goes looking for a nonce. They take their block of transactions along with a hash of the last known block. They add a random nonce and then calculate the hash of the resulting block. They do this over and over and over again. <laughs> If the numerical value of that hash is lower than some threshold, then they win. They mind a block. They get all the fees and all the, tr for the transaction along with a bunch of shiny new coins for themselves. If they fail, they just keep going. It's really hard to pick what data will have a particular hash number, so guessing the right value for the nonce takes a ton of calculations. Something like 20 quintillion hashes per second. A new block is mined on average about every eight or nine minutes, which means that every block requires something like 10 sextillion hashes to be calculated. And we make this number bigger by adjusting the threshold every couple of weeks, so it sticks around the one block every 10 minutes mark every, even as computers get faster. We throw all these calculations away though because the actual point is just to show you you're willing to waste electricity faster than anyone else. <laughs> but now we have a decentralized currency. We can say goodbye to all that worthless fiat currency and be free of all those horrible government things like taxes and fraud regulations. But it's not just about currency though. We can use this for all kinds of things. Just think, we could put contracts on there too. Instead of currency, we can stick contracts on there. Contracts written in code because code's always correct. <laughs> and it gets around all those kind of complex human interactions that we can solve with maths. And because maths is provable and everything's immutable, there's no way that any, ever that people will just scam the hell out of you. <laughs> the VC looks at them and says, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. What do you call this crap? And the libertarians reply, the blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks, I think, Benno. Uh, You're more than welcome. Am I really? Yes. Uh, on deck we have uh, Sasha Morrissey, but first, Paul Mc... Oh. Have you got the USB-C thing in? Oh, okay. There, there was about a minute left. Where's Keith? It's detected. Oh, I think Sasha. I think Sasha is almost ready to go. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll pause uh, we'll pause Paul McKenney for a moment and have uh, Sasha Morrissey up first. Um, generating C++ with Ginger 2 templates. 
Okay, so um, um, because I'm crazy, I'm going to cheat death and try and write code in a lightning talk. Um, <laughs> I don't have any slides. Okay, so uh, these are a thing called Ginger 2 templates. Some of you might know about them because you can use them to generate web pages, but you can use them to generate anything, not just HTML. And the cool thing about generating anything is most projects in programming have lots of different languages, and it's really annoying having to use code generation libraries to duplicate logic across all these different languages. So Ginger 2 lets you do that. So I'm going to show you by writing C++. So um, this is so this is just a Python file I wrote that you can see, um, and it's literally just opening this template.cp.templ file, which I'm going to fill in, um, and filling it with this context variable, which is all my like all the variables that are going to go into all my templates. Ideally, you'd put this in like a JSON uh, a JSON file or something. So I'm just going to put my name, and then we can write some C++. So like um, uh, using namespace standard. So uh, for now, I'm just going to do hello world. But why do hello world when I can do hello name? <laughs> um, and the cool thing about um, Ginger templates is you can also write like basically any logic that's valid Python. Um, so I can go like if name, do that. <laughs> Else, <laughs> um, hello there. Uh, and if yes, thank you. See, this is great. It's like. It's like pair programming, but with 600 people. <laughs> um, you can also use it to generate actual code. So like, if you imagine writing like a CLI or something, um, I can have a list of API methods, like read, write, exit, I don't know. Um, and then here I can do, so like normally you'd have to go like, oh wait, public. Normally you'd have to go like static, void, you know, read, blah, blah, blah. But instead we can write a for loop. <laughs> And just generate each method. This is like real lazy programming. Um, for the record, I work for Google, and I do do this as part of my job. <laughs> um, and we can just go like uh, API method name, and we can even write the like the logic for the function, like um, running. And because it's Python, you can literally do anything that's valid Python, like dot upper or like whatever. And then to call it, we can just call all of our functions in like a for loop. Uh, <laughs> in API methods, uh, my API, API method name. Yes, it's really hard writing on a podium. <laughs> okay, I think that's right. Are there any like obvious syntax errors? Let's find out. Okay, so this will run, this will generate the Python code and then try compile it. <laughs> okay. um, oh, that's, that's, cool. that's about the best time live demo I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sasha. <laughs> so, has the uh, has the uh, capture device uh, decided to come back to life? Yeah. So if. If we're lucky, this will get us back to the correct podium sides at the, uh, at the end of this session. Um, normally, the switches are so quick and, and fast, and you don't notice me talking, and so I have nothing prepared to say to you right now. You, re you really don't want to subject everyone to that. You really don't. Um, oh, it worked straight away? OK, uh, on deck on this side, hopefully, is Adam Brennecke. But first. Paul McKenney with whatever happened to the Linux kernel memory model. All right. We'll see if I can find my mouse after all this. <laughs> OK, well, I'm just going to go without slides here because this is getting uh, a little bit obnoxious. So uh, some of you, how many people were here last year and heard of my Linux kernel memory model presentation? Yeah, a few. Good. So what the heck happened with that anyway? Well, we were working on it for about a year. Um, first off, uh, one question people might have, another one is, what the heck is a memory model to begin with? And basically what it is, is something that takes small litmus tests, little pieces of concurrent code, and does a full state space search to determine whether some good or bad outcome is possible. It's a way of, uh, it's a debug tool or design tool to help you check your code out. And uh, we didn't have locking last time. We had just a very few atomic operations. Uh, we didn't have arithmetic. We've got all of those things now. We've got a 
rather long list of atomic operations, most of what the kernel provides, which is a full slide that you could see if I, we were getting this working. Um, and uh, the next question might be, are we going to get this thing in mainline anytime soon? And of course, that's always a good question. You never know. But uh, I did have sent two uh, patches, one in November, one a week or so ago. Um, I've gotten several maintainers uh, uh, acting it and reviewing it. So I sent a pull request. Maybe it'll make in the next merge window. I wouldn't bet on it, but maybe. And if not, we'll try the next one. So yeah, progress has been happening. We have memory models going along. They're improving. Uh, my partners of crime have done a lot of great work. And perhaps we'll actually get in the Linux kernel someday. With that, um, uh, they seem to be having about as much luck with that display as I was. <laughs> um, ooh, look at that. They've got images there. <laughs> I'm done, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so I see something on the screen here. It's, it, it's, it's, it's literally something I can't describe. <laughs> Wait, it's black again. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, uh, so uh, up on deck on this side, we have uh, Fraser Tweedale, but first, Adam Brennerke with CLI's User Interfaces 2. Line it off. Line it off. All right. Yep. Oh, what? Okay, can I get my time reset? Yay! All right, command line interfaces, user interfaces too. Normally when we're building a user interface, we put a lot of thought into how easy it is to use. If we're lucky, we even have people or teams whose job it is to do that. How do we take that and apply that to command line tools? Give things sensible names. It's okay to give your tool itself a clever or silly name. In fact, if you're writing Python, it's actually required by law. The uh, things that are within your tool should have names that make their meaning obvious. That doesn't mean choosing the name is obvious. Trying to name things well can take hours. Use consistent names. These three names all refer to the same thing in Git. Don't be like Git. Be consistent. Be consistent between different parts of your own CLI. Task Warrior has tags, it has dynamic tags, it has different places where tags are used. In every case, tags are denoted as a plus by, at the front. Be like Task Warrior. Different Git subcommands can be, have different ways to delete things. Don't be like Git. Here's why. This will try to create a branch named RM. I do this all the time. <laughs> be consistent with the eco ecosystem that you're in. Hello, okay. <laughs> uh, I think I pressed this button. Yay, okay. Uh, if you use the built-in argument parsing library in Go, it expects a single dash before every flag rather than a double dash. This means that everyone using your tool has to remember, oh, this is a weird Go thing. I need to use it differently to what you, I'm used to. Use a library that lets you do what your users expect. But don't go overboard on consistency. Sometimes doing things a little bit differently actually makes sense for your users if you've thought about it and you have a good reason for it. This is a switch statement in Bash. What's going on here? Why are there unbalanced parens? And what the hell is an ESAC? This is a switch statement in the fish shell. It's much easier to understand. It's not POSIX compatible, but that's okay. You don't need to be all things to all people, especially if you're sacrificing usability for it. Have good defaults. You might not think of defaults as being part of your user interface, but they are. Docker has sane defaults, so people don't shoot themselves in the foot. Because of Docker's defaults, I don't need to understand namespaces or capabilities or all of the things that Jess talked about this morning to start using it, even though I can learn about them and adjust the dials later. This is why Docker is popular. Be like Docker. Firewall D in Fedora ships with every incoming port over 10.24 open by default. Users expect their firewall to block things by default, and this is the exact opposite. Don't be like Firewall D. On a similar vein, configuration files are also part of your UI. Use a common format that's clear and widely understood so that your users only have to think about the actual configuration that they're doing rather than your crazy custom syntax too. I've done it again. Uh, don't ship a default configuration file with a million things in it. That just makes it hard for your users to keep track of what they've ch changed. When your default config is an empty file, your users can also roll back to the default by deleting everything. Your same default should kick in for, uh, for a particular option if it's missing. Document everything, command line options, config files, interactive mode behavior, use lots of examples, writing good docs as an art in and of itself if you do nothing else, do this. So, why should we care about CLI user interfaces anyway? Uh, these things are developers and operators, they're computer people, they can just figure it out. No. Your tool is not the only thing in the universe. We do not have infinite memory. The less I have to understand and remember about your tool in order to use it, the better. We do not emerge for, uh, from our mother's rooms with an intricate understanding of Git's underlying data model. The easier your tool is to use, the less time it takes to learn, and the more your users can spend on important, uh, more time your users can spend on important things. That's all. I'm on Twitter. You can tell me there about why I'm wrong. <laughs>
Ru Russell, 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 you're out of a job. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, okay, okay. Uh, Molly DeBlanc, you're on deck. But first, Fraser Tweeddale telling us how to be like Git, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, uh, g'day. So this is a talk about the power of Git's underlying data model. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you use a static site builder like uh, Jekyll or Hackle or Pelican, or if you build documentation for your project and you want to commit that to a branch to be pushed and published somewhere, um, you'll end up with the situation like you've got this directory with all the artifacts and then you want to commit that to a branch. So um, here's my blog directory. Uh, I use Hackle. Uh, which is written in Haskell, but that's beside the point. So uh, if I just build this, um, it'll just take a moment and it'll dump that in the underscore site directory. So in the meantime, I'm going to try and work out how I'm going to commit that to a branch like GH Pages. Uh, so I go to Stack Overflow and this one tells me, oh, well, uh, just make a whole other clone of your repo uh, in the underscore site directory. So I'm going to have a repo inside my repo. It's like, yo, dog, I heard you like Git repositories, but yeah, anyway. Um, so that doesn't really appeal to me. Um, this one wants me to like delete all of my files and then copy the site directory somewhere and add some stuff. I'm like, oh, that sounds complicated. Uh, this one, yeah, tells me I should use two Git repos. And also, uh, Git isn't designed to have one directory managed on one branch with another directory managed in a second branch. And uh, that's not true. So. Um, Okay, good, my, um, my site's built. It's living in the underscore site directory. So uh, now I want to create a, a new branch. So I don't currently have a GH pages branch. Actually, that's a lie, I do. So I'm gonna call this one site. So git uh, orphan branch, this is not a standard command, site. And now I have the site branch and it's empty. There's nothing in it yet. And now I'll say git uh, snapshot the underscore site directory onto the site branch, uh, git ga. OK, I see there's a new commit there. It's got a timestamp in it. And git show site. And that's added everything that was in the underscore site directory onto that branch. And then I can just push that for publication. So what do those commands actually do? Uh, well, it's just a couple of simple, um, simple git aliases uh, or fun branch. Yep, see, simple. And uh, <laughs> git help uh, snapshot. And that one's pretty simple too. So basically, <laughs> what it does is it uh, uses some environment variables to trick git about what index file it should use and what its working directory actually is. Um, it then reads the uh, current ref into the index, adds everything on the branch, um, diffs it. If it doesn't diff, if the diff's clean, it uh, exits. If not, um, it adds all of that to the branch and then commits it and updates the ref. And uh, you can get the code there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Fraser. I was going to say something mean, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see. Uh, so second last talk is going to be Molly DeBlanc. Uh, Alistair Chapman, if you can uh, be on deck. Uh, everybody, Molly. Can you hear me? Okay, anyway, hi, I'm Molly DeBlanc, and this is about matching donations and small, small, reset. Okay, testing, testing, testing. No. Lectern mic. Lectern. Whoa. <laughs> Hey everybody! Okay, I'm Molly DeBlanc and this is about matching donations and small donor fundraising and I will try not to talk too quickly. Running a nonprofit is very expensive, it turns out. And people hold nonprofits to very high standards. One of the ways that people measure nonprofits is how much money goes to overhead. Overhead includes things like salaries. I work at a nonprofit, that includes my salary. So who supports nonprofits? Who is a small donor? Small donors support nonprofits. Those are people who are individuals who are either members or donors. Uh, generally, it's $500 or less in terms of how much they're donating. Uh, so who are small donors? You guys. Probably a lot of you do that. At least I hope you do, and I would really appreciate it if you do. 
Um, so there's this thing nonprofits do called matching donations. Matching donations are cool and inspiring. It's when one individual or organization, usually an organization, who has a lot of money agrees to, per, uh, to put forward some amount of that, like say $10,000, uh, that should donations reach 10,000, they will then, should small donor donations reach 10,000, they will then give that 10,000 in the first place. I think small, I think matching donations are so cool that each year I put aside 10% of my income and during November and December I do matching donations. So during that time if somebody sends me a receipt where they've, where they've given at least $100 or a maximum of $100 to a nonprofit, I will then give that nonprofit $100 as well. Molly Give this year was so, I didn't name it by the way. Molly Give this year was so exciting to me, especially because two other people also agreed to do this. And therefore, every $100 someone donated suddenly became $400. Um, I hope that in future Molly Gives, I'll be able to intentionally go out of my way to help other people kind of join this coalition and do this together. Um, so I have a proposal, which is that we build more matching fund coalitions, where we as individuals get together and agree that we'll raise a certain amount of money that we'll be putting in, um, and that that will then go to matching donations. Uh, here are some awesome charities you can support, by the way. There's Code Club Australia, the Electronic Frontiers Australia, Free Software Foundation, Linux Australia, the Open Source Initiative, and the Software Freedom Conservancy. You know, I was going to wait all the way until next November to really launch Molly Give with more matching donations from people more than just me, but I decided I couldn't wait that long. Um, so over LCI, I've been talking with some people, and a group of us are aiming to put together $10,000 to do a matching donation for the Software Freedom Conservancy Spring Fundraiser. We're almost there, and you two could join. Um, but regardless of whether or not you do that, I really hope a lot of you will consider uh, donating and supporting the nonprofits that do great work and that you'll consider what it might mean to together get together to encourage others to donate by forming coalitions. Thank you. Yeah, so if, if, you, if, you have some, uh, if you have some money that you would like to, uh, that you'd like to donate, come find Molly. She has blue hair. <laughs> Should be very easy to spot in this room. Uh, our last lightning talk is Alistair Chapman, who's going to talk about abusing Docker for fun and pointless tech demos. Okay, everyone hear me now? Yep. All right, so all week we've been hearing about the wonders of Docker, which is why I'm going to stand here for three minutes and just say Docker, 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 Docker over and over again until you all get the idea. Now, this, there's been all sorts of really helpful features talked about with Docker, and this morning's keynote was thrilling. This is none of those things. This is stupid shit. Just utterly, outrageously bad. So. A lot of people will be used to, for example, the date command. The date command has the neat ability of telling you the current date and time. And using environment variables, you can, for example, get the date in a different time zone. So I can quickly run date, and I can find out what the date time is in Pacific Standard Time, which is very helpful. But that's, that's, a, that's not what we want. What we want to do is put that in a container. <laughs> so what you do is you bind mount in your entire zone info section, Pretend to trick your container into thinking that's the current local time and then just ask it for the date anyway. So obviously on my machine I've aliased date to that because it was so much faster. I mean, having to actually run a command, that's just difficult. I'd much prefer to spin out whole containers every single time you do it. This is obviously the correct answer to any solution. Even if Docker can't do it, just keep mounting things and eventually it'll just start working. It's pretty incredible. If, if anyone questions, just put dash dash privileged. I don't think anything bad can happen after you do that. Now, when you run containers, you'll often see things that just suggest, oh, just put in your own Docker file, it'll be fine. And so you look at their Docker file, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty reasonable. It's just an entry point. That's no real big issue. Of course, you can just build your Docker file. And so I'm just going to build the world's most pointless um, Fedora image here, which is just going to build a complete new copy of Fedora, where all it's actually going to helpfully do is tell me that, oh, there you go, tell me I can't write Docker files very well. Uh, the <laughs> Let's try that again, shall we? This is why you don't do... Yep, that's not going to work. Uh, for, for what it's worth, all it's telling me is the truth I already know, which is there's no such thing as too much abstraction. Now, that, that's helpful, but what you really want to do is do your building in a container as well. I mean, that's the command you have to type out every single time you build, but I think that's obviously worth it because it doesn't work. <laughs> so I'm just going to skip right over that one because that one's terrible. Now. What we have here is a much more helpful one, which is that I have another Docker file, and this, this Docker file has its own command, and the, the commands it's running aren't that important, because what you really need to know is I can quickly build it, and ideally this one will actually work, would be nice. 
Uh, and if it does, it's going to run some things. And it's going to run that, that image in the background. Um, and afterwards, it's going to clean up, clean up after itself. Of course, an image that cleans up after itself is not particularly helpful, because if we go have a look at um, what's running, we actually have a container that every time it exits just creates a new copy of itself. And it will do... <laughs> It will do this literally forever, which is why you can obviously have the, uh, the replicators case where it will literally just keep doing this forever and ever and rabbit multiply like rabbits. This is what Docker was built for, rabbit multiplying containers. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you. Um, so that, that was indeed the last of our lightning talks. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the last 14, uh, 14 talks worth of really quite interesting topics. Um, another round of applause for our Lightning Talk presenters.